Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Cara and I work in, at WSET in the EMEA business development team. Today's webinar is being brought to you by WSET, the world leader in wine, spirit and sake education, who have partnered with the Conseil Interprofessionnel de Vin de Bordeaux to bring you the first of a series of three webinars all about the wonders of Bordeaux. The webinar will be recorded and made available to watch on the WSET Global Events Hub, which can be found on YouTube. We have quite a quick session for you today. We're going to try to keep it to about 20 minutes. Um, so if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will do our absolute best as much to answer as many of those as possible at the end but my apologies if we don't manage to get through all of them. So we're really lucky today to be joined by the wonderful Sabine Silvestrini. Sabine is a third generation oenologist and wine grower at Vignoble Silvestrini, which is a winery which compi comprises 36 hectares in total, spanning over three of the most prestigious appellations in the Libonais. So we're talking about Lussac saint emilion Montagne saint emilion and Pomerol. Sabine also crucially has been awarded the level three award in wines. So she's a good WSET ambassador. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sabine to talk you through the red wines of Bordeaux. Hi everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you today because uh, of course, uh, you know, Bordeaux wines, it's part of my uh, History, it's part of my patient as well. And um, as a Bordeaux educator in the Bordeaux Wine School, I'm very pleased to, of course, share my knowledge with you today. So, of course, I'm going to introduce you the vineyard of Bordeaux. We're going to speak about uh, what's Bordeaux today, what does it mean today with the women and men. And, of course, I'll try to um, bring you the five facts you have to know about Bordeaux wines nowadays. Um, so thank you for to join us and uh, let's start with this uh, introduction. So just uh, I think some key figures are important just for you to, to understand how Bordeaux is important in the French vineyard. Uh, it's about uh, 5,500 wine growers, um, mostly family run estates. The average size property is almost 20 hectares, which is about 49 acres. The cells in Bordeaux have a, a specific way to, to run, like uh, we have wine merchants, the wine merchants, there are about 300 of them. Uh, we have also 77 brokers. Uh, it's important to understand that the brokers never buy wines. The brokers help the exchange between the producers and the wine merchant. So the broker is just like an intermediary that helps the contract to, to happen. And uh, of course, they have a um, two percent of the the, the income uh, in in the con each contract uh, made thanks to them. But it's um, it's very specific to Bordeaux this way to to run. It's also important to understand that the wine merchant deals about seventy five percent of the wine production in Bordeaux. So it's a significant volume when we usually produce about five, um, let's say five uh, million hectoliters per year, which is of course a significant volume. We also have wine cooperative. Wine cooperatives, they are almost like wineries, except that they don't earn, they don't own their own land. Most of the time, the growers would bring the crop to the cooperative, which would make the wine and sell the wine for them. So we have about 29 cooperatives and three unions of cooperative in, in Bordeaux. Just um, for you to understand, the vineyard in, uh, of Bordeaux is considered as the largest AOC vineyard in France. We have about 110,000 hectares, which is about 271 acres. Um, it's the largest vineyard 
producing mainly AOC's wine. The, la the largest vineyard in surface in area is the Languedoc Roussillon, but Bordeaux is meant to produce only AOC's wine. So it is the largest vineyard area producing only AOC's wine. We have about 65 appellations, what I call the AOC's, um, appellation of controlled origin and um, well you definitely know most of those 65 appellations because it's important to understand that uh, it's also a matter of colors we produce of course um, red grape varieties white grape varieties and out of those grapes we would be able to produce about six different colors of wine we produce red wines about 85% uh, of red wines, we produce about 4% of claret and rosé. We also produce um, dry white wine, sweet white wine, and sparkling wine. So that's uh, um, for the, the production. The dry whites are 9% and we have a very small production of uh, sweet wines and, and sparkling wines, which we would call crément. De Bordeaux. So that's about the, the different colors of wine we would be able to, to produce. Um, and it's important to understand that nowadays about 75% of the vineyard area is certified with any environmental approach. So that's the key figure for 2021. The target is to reach 100% uh, of the area certified by 2023. And uh, we're running to this uh, target, of course. What kind of certification would you be able to find? It could be either organic certification, it could be sustainable certification with the, the, um, the Terra Viti certification. It could be HVE, it's a high environmental value or it could be Demeter for the biodynamic or biodynamic uh, wines. When we go further, um, if we want to, to explain each part, uh, and before we go further, I'd like to ask you a, a quick quiz. Um, just to see if you follow just what I just said, could you tell me what person of the Bordeaux vineyard is red or white. Of course, you can answer in the Q&A. You have the choice between 89% red, 11% wine, 72 red or, and 28 white, or 61 red and 39 white. You just have a couple of seconds to answer because it's an easy question. I almost gave you the answer before. Yeah, most of you, you have the right answer. Of course, you're right. It's 89% red. Of course, out of this 89% of red, it's 85% red wine and um, 4 to 5% of uh, claret and rosé. I def definitely think, consider that you all know the difference between rosé and claret. I truly think it's important to remind you that uh, rosé has to be coming from a direct pressing, when the clairé is made out of uh, what we call in French a saigné, it's a, a cut, it's a, we bleed the tank. So it needs a certain time maceration, pre-maceration between juice and skin before we separate the juice from the skin. So that's the main difference between the rosé and the clairé. And of course the clairé would be much uh, deeper in color, even though it's still a light wine, and um, more concentrated in aromas and, and uh, more full-bodied, even though we're not talking much about tannin in clary. Let's keep going and, um, and talking further on about what's going on in Bordeaux. I told you that we produce a majority of uh, uh, red grape varieties. The Merlot is the king of the, uh, of the region uh, for one main reason, reason, sorry, it's a matter of terroir. Uh, it's known as the ripe band variety, but the Merlot is found all over the Bordeaux vineyard just because it suits perfectly to clay and limestone soils, which is the main type of soils that we would find in Bordeaux, of course, on the right bank, in between the Dordogne River and the Garonne River, and in some parts of the left bank as well, where you don't have that much gravels, because the left bank is much more well known for the gravel soils. 
When we have lots of gravels, the grape variety that we love to use is the Cabernet Sauvignon. It represents about 22% of our uh, grape production. It's a late ripening grapes. It's very powerful, very elegant, very um, um, expressive on the nose. But definitely, because it's a late ripening grapes, it needs some heat to warm up and the grapes and uh, to mature properly. So that's why the Cabernet Sauvignon suits so well to the gravel soils. And that's why we have so much mellow all over the Bordeaux vineyard, because on clay and limestone soils, then it's much cooler and it suits much more to early ripening grapes, such as the Merlot. We love the Cabernet Franc as well. That's why it represents about 9% of our varieties because it's a good um, in between the two grape varieties, let's say. Um, it's a, a later ripening grape than the Merlot, but not as late as the Cabernet Sauvignon. So it could suit to good um, limestone soil with a good sun exposure. That's why lots of people would use the Cabernet Franc especially on the right bank or in between the Dordogne River and the Garonne River. Of course, we have all the grape varieties that we could use. There are six red grape varieties in, in Bordeaux. We use the Petit Verdot, which is as well a late ripening grape that suits much better to gravel soils. But we also use uh, Carmenère and Malbec. I would say that Carmenère is probably the one that we use the less, even though some people are replanting those grape varieties. Uh, because with the global warming and the change of climate, maybe we could uh, obtain much better results with the Carmenère and the Malbec that we used to do 50 years ago. So that's something that is uh, in people's mind at the moment. Um, if we keep talking about uh, the specificities of Bordeaux and, and switch slide. Um, uh, just uh, to answer the question about the, the new uh, varieties approved, actually they are approved because they are already planted. What happened is that in uh, 2014, the CIVB, so our uh, wine council, um, offered to or started an experimentation. So there's about a, a hundred growers that were volunteer to um, keep some of their plot to experiment those grape varieties. So they've been planted for almost six years now. And now that they are starting to produce uh, grapes and, um, and make you know, interesting style of wines, uh, we recently accepted those new grape varieties in the AOC Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur. So nowadays, the 100 wine growers that are involved in this experimentation are able to use those experimental grape varieties in their blend, um, but the maximum would be 5% of the final blend. So that's uh, uh, about the, your, um, your question. So of course, it's already a load only for the people who are involved in this experimentation, because at some stage, of course, those people are volunteer and they are working all year long on their plots. And of course, at some stage, you have to enable them to make some wine with those grapes. So it is already the case for, uh, so there are uh, five different grape varieties or six different grape varieties, four red and two whites. I guess you already know the, the name, but I can answer later the, the question if you want to know more about those grapes. Let's talk about the, the, the red wines. Um, and so where do we produce red wines? Of course, pretty much all over the, the Bordeaux vineyard area because it's a large percentage of our production, mostly in AOC's Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur. So it's about 51% of the production of red wines. Um, then the Medoc uh, and Grave AOC's, of course, are really focused uh, on red wines, even though you could find some dry white in the Grave and Pessac Léonien appellation, it represents just a very small proportion. Um, then um, about the Côte de Bordeaux, it represents about 14% of their production. Some of the Côte also produce a little bit of dry white and a little bit of sweet white, but it's going to be uh, for another webinar, and uh, of course, saint emile pomerol fronsac group, so the 10 appellation in the Libourne are only focused on red wine. So they produce 13% uh, of red wines, and they 
are only allowed to produce red wines. Um, then to talk about um, the specificities of the, uh, the Bordeaux vineyard, about res and how men and women are involved. Um, maybe we can switch slides. And, um, and just to, of course, it's important to understand about the, the terroir. Uh, we try to have uh, minimal interventions in the vineyard. Basically, the notion of terroir is something that works if you consider that the nature is able to give anything the vine and the grapes would need to mature properly. So I consider that the growers are just there to you know, look after the vineyard, but not to change the vineyard and not to change the nature of the terroir. We're just there to help the wine to the vine to grow properly, produce properly, we protect it. It's like, you know, parents for their child. Uh, you're not there to oblige them to go one way. You're just there to guide them and educate them. So that's what we try to do with the, the vineyard, just to, you know, let it grow naturally um, as much as it could, um, try to make sure that it, we find the perfect terroir to help to express the better the grape could express. So um, grapes would be um, harvested early most of the time. This year, it seems like we're gonna have a quite early uh, harvest. We're talking about the 10th of September for the earliest red. Um, and we, um, of course, try to reach different level of ripeness. Even though we used to work with only the technical ripeness, we also work a lot now with the phenolic ripeness and the aromatic ripeness. From um, harvest to the end of vinification, the wines are treated in individual batches because we try to separate each terroir, each uh, grape varieties, of course, just to make sure that each terroir would express its own, you know, components. And then, of course, that's thanks to the blending that we would obtain the complexity, the elegance, the harmony that we expect for our wines. Of course, um, producers are planting vines on cooler plots that have less exposure to the sun in order to preserve the qualities of each terroir. Um, and especially with the global warming, we are thinking a lot about maybe adapting the way we work the vineyard to manage more shade, more freshness, uh, instead of uh, thinking of changing our grape varieties. That's uh, what we're trying to do at the moment. So plot management is really, really the most important uh, because that's where everything starts, everything's begin. And uh, that's if the plot management is good, then we're pretty sure to obtain grape uh, that are perfect, you know, to make great wines. And that's what we expect. Uh, if we switch slide, um, then of course, we're gonna speak about the, the, the aim we want to reach in Bordeaux with our red wines. Um, Bordeaux red, you could have different style of red wines. Everybody has this in mind, uh, Bordeaux wines as wines that are meant to be aged, wines that would uh, be uh, with a, a certain style, like elegant, could get some uh, tertiary aromas by aging. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that Bordeaux, it's not only based on aging, you know, we have so many different AOCs, uh, we produce so many different red wines that um, we work a lot to express the fruit, we try to um, shorter and be more gentle on maceration cycles to have less um, tannic uh, extraction. We try to have uh, uh, a certain fineness, subtlety in the tannin. The pumping over um, is less systematic now. Some people would work with pigeage, some people would do one delestage, but uh, as long as the maturity, the phenolic maturity is perfect, it's, you can have very smooth pumping over. It's sufficient you know, to have the, the body we expect for Bordeaux wines. So we have less intervention just to make sure that we wouldn't have um, wines that are gonna to be too harsh, too astringent enough. Then of course, there's a lot of um, 
uh, innovation in alternative uh, aging vessel, people using stainless steel. It's well, the stainless steel really developed in Bordeaux in the 80s, but lots of people are going back to use uh, concrete tanks, which was, you know, even before the stainless steel. But lots of people are, are switching now their stainless steel against concrete tanks, even though they have a more modern shape, let's say. Um, the, the amphoras, the terracottas are very um, trendy at the moment as well. And the foudre are coming back, you know, the, the oak foudre are coming back as well. Just because we've noticed that the shape of the tank, more than just the, the, the material, because the material is important in terms of temperature and how we manage to control the temperature, but the shape of the tank is also uh, very important for all the convection movement, for the, the electromagnetic, you know, the electronics, um, uh, or electrons, I don't know how you say in English properly, but uh, uh, all the electromagnetic um, waves in the tank are important, you know, to remove the lees, to give some smoothness, some roundness to the wine. So that's something that we are working a lot. And also because we know that some uh, materials are very interesting uh, to help to have a, a little bit of micro oxygenation, natural mi micro oxygenation, which is really, really important, either to stabilize the color uh, and help the, the, the anthocyanins to bond with the tannins. So that's something very important and it helps to have wines that are much smoother, rounder, even though they are full bodied and powerful, the, the tannin and the balance would be much better with this kind of containers. Can we just switch maybe to the following slide? Of course, um, when we speak about you know technique in the in the cellar, it's also to understand what we're having in our glass. Uh, and so, um, a growing number of Bordeaux properties um, offer now vegan wines or sulfite-free options as well. It's something very trendy. I wouldn't say that it's something that is getting like a, a standard in Bordeaux, but lots of um, growers would have a, a specific batch that they work this way in their ranch. So they would have maybe their first growth, which is the one that they promote as the aging one. They have their, their second growth with um, a more fruity style, uh, easier accesses to, to it. And maybe the, then they have a, either a vegan or sulfite-free a wine just to enlarge their range and make sure that they would reach also different consumers. Uh, of course, those wine would pair well with today's gastronomy preferences. Uh, we eat lighter, like even us French, you know, we, we are known to have a, an hour and a half break uh, for lunch. It's not the case anymore. Like most of the time, like anyone else, we have just 30 minutes we don't want to have um, heavy reds uh, with a, such a short lunch. So we also need fresh old style of wine to this kind of lunch time or lunch break. Um, and of course, um, we also try to have lighter lunches, so more vegetarian or um, lighter weight dishes in general. So that's something that we would appreciate to have fresher or fruitier style of wine bottle red as well uh, for lunch, for example. Of course, um, there's many, many changes also in the appearance of our bottles. Um, it's quite difficult, to be honest, because most of the markets for bottle wines, they want the very traditional bottle shape bottle. They want uh, square or rectangular uh, labels. They want the, the chateau on it. But likefully it tends to change and um, we have uh, more and more colorful uh, labels. We have uh, sometimes some bottles that change shape with uh, coming from other part of France or coming from uh, with an old style of bottle. So lots of uh, things are, are changing. Um, I would say it's not that the growers didn't want to do this kind of change before, it's just probably because the market wasn't ready for it. And I'm pretty sure that nowadays the market is ready for it. 
And that's why we have um, noticed so many changes in the, in the marketing and in the, the labeling of our bottles of water rates. Uh, so if you, uh, of course, have to summarize what we want you to, uh, to memorize about this bottle reds, uh, is that um, we are very, very involved in um, environmentally friendly uh, methods. We are uh, very conscious of the difference on the different style of uh, res that are expected by the market at the moment. And the, the large, the range of border reds is huge because we have many different AOCs, different prices level as well. And um, I would say that there's a, a, a red for each taste, you know, um, and I think that's uh, definitely something uh, important. So I've told you pretty much everything I wanted. Of course, if you have some question, I'll be very happy to answer your question, Kara. So, Sabine, we have a lot of questions. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> well, I love questions. <laughs> so I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through all of them, but okay. we will start off. So what is the per percentage split of right bank versus left bank of red, of red production? Well, uh, actually, I don't have the key, the data, but well, um, well, 13 is the red production in, in Saint-Emilion for Moral Fronsac, then the board, the Côte de Bordeaux, it's uh, regarding that it's Blaye Côte de Bordeaux, Côte de Bourg, uh, Castillon Côte de Bordeaux, Franc Côte de Bordeaux. I would say that about two thirds of the Côtes are located on the right bank as well. So I would say that um, it's probably something like, uh, even though the Medoc is large, you know, and, mm -hmm. and all the, the, the Medoc appellations, so the eight Medoc appellation only produce red. So it is still a, a, a quite significant percentage of red wines. I would say that uh, there's probably about one third of the production on the left bank. Great, thank you. Um, and we've got a question from Ken asking, are the higher average temperatures causing changes in the flavor of the grapes? Not really. Well, actually, uh, even though we've noticed a little bit of change in the average temperature, of course, it has changed like within the last 20 years, we've noticed like about uh, the European five degrees um, uh, more than that it was. Um, it's just a matter on how, when we peak. So it's just not just a matter of you know the weather changing. It also depends on when we decide the grape would be mature. So if we want to keep the freshness and the elegance of our Merlot, we know how to do it. Like uh, we just have to pick. Um, I, I like this story. Like you know, when I finished my studies in 2004 in enology, um, my you know famous teachers I had I had Mr. Glory, Mr. Dubourdieu at school. I was quite lucky to meet those uh, wonderful people. And they teach us that the maturity was 110 days after the flowering season. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that within the last 20 years, we've probably picked 120 or 125 days after the florism. So let's say that if we're going back to what the, the ancient um, teach us, maybe we're going to be closer to what we expect from a proper Merlot in Bordeaux. So that's, I think, the key. And that's why we are more focusing on how to manage the canopy, manage the freshness to make sure that it wouldn't change the typicity of our grapes. Yeah, no, it's really important. Yeah. Um, and we are very tight on time, so I'm going to give you about 20 or 30 seconds to answer this last question. Yeah. I'm sorry if you haven't had your question read out. We have a lot of them. Um, so what are the new experimental grape varieties? Well, uh, it's the... <laughs> I think you, you better see them written, actually, because it's the <laughs> Lilio Rila, it's the Arinar Noa, it's uh, Touriga Nacional, um, the, I forgot the other ones, um, Lilio Rila, Arinar Noa, Touriga Nacional, you'll find them on the internet, and for sure, it's going to be much easier for you if you can read them, because their names are just horrible. And they are, they are not so well known, apart from the Touriga Nacional that you all know. The other one, they are very ancient grape varieties, so you better read them. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sabine. That's been really, really insightful. I'm impressed at how much you managed to fit in to quite a short session. Um, so there's lots for people to think about and I hope everyone's going to go away and open a nice bottle of red. Um, so thank you also to the CIVB. Without whom this would not have been uh, possible at all. Thank you to everyone who has attended today. Um, just to remind you that this session will be made available on our WSET Events Hub, which is on YouTube. So you can find a whole host of different videos there on different topics, different great varieties, different regions. It's a really good um, source of information. So please do have a look at that if you've enjoyed this today. Um, and also, so this is the first of a series of, of three webinars that we're doing on Bordeaux. So next week at the same time, we will be looking at the white wines of Bordeaux. And then on the 26th of January, we're going to be looking at Cremel and Rosé wines. So please join us again for that. Um, if you would like to know more about the WSET qualifications, please visit our Where to Study um, page, which is at wsetglobal.com. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you, Cara. Bye-bye.